tonight to hopefully give you some great insight into real world experience into public relations. We have some great panelists for you that are gonna really give you the ins and outs of the fields and how they got started and how everything has been impacted by COVID and just hopefully some great tips to really, you know, get you going. So without further ado, I'd like all of the panelists to just quickly go around, introduce themselves and give us like a brief summary of what they did. So Steve, why don't we start with you? Sounds good, Suzanne, thanks. Um, welcome everybody and uh, we're excited to do this program tonight. I'm a 1974 journalism graduate of Penn State and I held a variety of uh, corporate and agency positions through my career. I got into healthcare at uh, an ad agency in the mid eighties when I was actually starting up the PR operation. And I kind of parlayed that experience into um, a 25 career, 25 year career at AstraZeneca, uh, a big global pharmaceutical company. And um, I was uh, head of corporate affairs and product PR uh, and global PR for AstraZeneca uh, when I retired in uh, 2011. And I was responsible for corporate image, product PR, association relations, and uh, agency management. So I have a lot of contacts still with the agencies, PR agencies. Uh, when I retired, I started my own public affairs consulting firm, and I've been uh, doing that now for several years. And uh, I also have a uh, freshman daughter at Penn State in communications at University Park, and I've been on this board for two years. Fantastic. Scott, why don't you go next? Great. Thanks, Suzanne. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Scott Nolte. Uh, I am a military legislative assistant for a U.S. Senator, Senator Jerry Moran from Kansas. Uh, so I, I'm a 2016 graduate of Penn State, uh, graduate with a degree in public relations and a minor in political science. So I kind of took a, a little bit of a different turn than most public relations students do. Instead of going to do in-house communications or go to a PR firm or something like that, uh, I ended up coming down to Washington, D.C. and working on the Hill. Uh, so I started working uh, as a legislative correspondent, which is basically uh, you know, a staffer for a House member, uh, the House of Representatives. Uh, and I managed all the constituent and uh, kind of external communications that you know, was not media related, more uh, individually focused for the congressman. Uh, and then I also handled a number of uh, policy portfolios to include uh, national security, foreign affairs, veterans affairs, uh, homeland security, judiciary. Uh, so worked for uh, in the House of Representatives for about three years uh, before I moved over to the Senate. Uh, and now uh, you know, working for the Senator, I focus strictly on national security, military, uh, and veterans mm -hmm. affairs policy. So while it is kind of policy focused, uh, there is a lot of PR and communications work that goes on behind it. We're usually the first ones that are, are writing speeches, writing talking points, working with uh, different companies and media outlets to make sure that they are correctly portraying any kind of policy work that we're doing correctly, that they get the nuance of the policy correct. Uh, and then it's up to our comms team uh, to kind of work with those outlets to you know, pitch ideas and things like that. So one way to think about what I do is, is the meat behind a lot of the communications efforts. Um, so I've been on the board for about a year now. Uh, it's been a great experience and looking forward to, to telling you a little bit more about uh, a non-traditional PR career and answering some of your questions. Fantastic. Thanks, Scott. Joe, why don't you share with us what you do? Had to unmute first. <laughs> um, hello, everybody. Nice to be here. Wish we could see you. I can't see you on my, uh, my screen, but... Um, I have a uh, long career in broadcast and cable television. And um, like a lot of people who went to Penn State back when I did, um, I really wanted to do something else altogether than what I ended up doing. Um, specifically, I wanted to be on air and uh, mostly radio and ended up in a pretty much in the business side of, of media. I have worked at a number of companies over the years, uh, one right in State College. I don't know if it's still around, Center Broadcasting. They owned at the time WMAJ Radio. And um, a company called Group W, which was Westinghouse Electric, that owned a very large media component, one of their divisions. 
um, after that CBS television in New York, and then Washington Post, Post Newsweek at their Detroit TV station, Comcast for Michigan, Comcast Universal. And, um, and then at the end of all that, went out on my own and became a consultant. And I still do some of that. I've had a couple of really interesting uh, projects involving some large companies and some very small companies, mostly in the area of pricing and business controls and management. Um, so I've moved around quite a bit. I've lived, uh, I'm from Pittsburgh. Um, I left Pittsburgh and moved to New York. And then I moved to Philadelphia and then Pittsburgh again, and then New York again, Chicago somewhere in there. And, um, and now I'm in Detroit. So I've moved around this corner of the country quite a bit of, quite a bit of times. Um, I don't, I've, I've never worked uh, directly in PR, oddly enough, but everywhere I've worked, no matter the job or the office I was in, we had an in-house PR staff. It was that important to all the companies I've worked for uh, that we had an in-house staff. And in fact, we had in-house creative and all of it was necessary. We, we decided a long time ago that in every division we would have, in every outpost, we would have somebody or a staff in those two areas. And in fact, only hired um, outside PR help and media help, creative help, uh, when we either had a huge project we were working on, like syndicating a, a TV show where we needed some help with the marketing, or in PR when we were up to our necks in a crisis situation and um, out of our element and, and needed help, needed saving. So that's my career, and um, you can move on to the next person. Thanks, Joe. I think what you said is so important because so many of us start out in the College of Com and we're really not quite sure what we want to do and what area of the business we want to touch. So it's so important to hear about all the different routes, traditional or not. I know Katie does have a traditional agency route. So why don't you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, um, I think it's actually interesting. It is, I guess, you know, I do work at an agency now, but um, didn't start out right away at an agency, which I do think is a little different. Um, but I've been at DKC for two and a half years now, and I sit across our sports and our media tech groups. Um, so most of my experience prior to this has been in sports or media. So just kind of combining those two, which is really fun. Um, and yeah, so I've worked with publishing companies, talent representation. Um, so currently I work with clients like Bloomberg, Time, uh, Medium, and also on the sports side, Manchester City, the Olympic Channel, um, MLB and YouTube. So really anything that sits at that center intersection of sports and media, I'm really involved in, and then some additional media things outside of that. And uh, like Scott, I also graduated in 2016 and joined the board a year ago. Very cool. And just so everyone knows, my name is Suzanne. I currently work at Game Show Network, more on the advertising sales side, but we do have a PR department, which very similar to everyone that's spoken, really works to promote Game Show Network and all the different things about it. So we're excited to kind of dive into everyone's experiences today. And I think off the bat, I'd really love to ask you, Katie, how you got your foot in the door for your first job and what, you, what would you recommend to people? Yeah, definitely. Um, so my first job, it was a post-grad like fellowship type thing at Octagon, which does talent representation for athletes and celebrities, entertainers, uh, but mainly athletes. Um, I honestly didn't know anyone there, which was pretty cool just to kind of do a cold, um, cold apply and for things to work out on that end. But I didn't get that position until, you know, two weeks after graduation or something. So one piece of advice I will give is that, you know, things take time and just to kind of be patient and be very broad with your search and apply for as many things as you can, because you just never know what's going to work out. And 
I'm sure, you know, this year is more difficult and interesting than ever, I'm sure. But then, you know, my first real job, I actually found on Twitter, which is how I think I like am so good at being a publicist and I just find so many incredible things on Twitter. So that was how I found my first real job. Um, and the person who was hiring, I had actually gone to high school with, um, and we had like lots of, lots of mutual friends. We didn't know each other, but definitely helped to actually have a connection for that first real job. Definitely. I think that's so important having a connection, whether it's Penn State, whether it's someone in your classes, and you also touched on something that's really crucial as well for anyone in the college of calm. You don't realize this until after you graduate you really can't get a job until after you graduate. Ignore all of your business school friends, like everyone in comm, it's always, okay, when can you start? Because we're looking for you to start tomorrow. There are so many agencies that always reach out to me that are like, we need a media assistant today. So I would just definitely keep that in mind. And I think Katie, that's so important and just great about the connection and using something like Twitter as well. Scott, what about you? Yeah, so I uh, I start actually got my foot in the door uh, through the Penn State Washington program. Uh, so if anyone's not familiar with this program, uh, it's ran through the College of Communications. Uh, it's mostly College of Comm students, but other students from other colleges are also eligible to apply. But they essentially go through a process where uh, you know they interview and, and take applicants uh, for students who are interested in jobs in Washington D.C. So like I said, I work on the Hill, but a lot of the people that were in the program with me also went into uh, you know, work at boutique PR firms, public affairs firms, uh, some uh, journalism, uh, print media, uh, and, and broadcast media. Um, and the program really tries to use a lot of its alumni connections to connect students to intern in DC. Uh, and when I did it, uh, I don't know if they still do this, but they basically guaranteed at least you know one internship offer, which was huge. Uh, so through that program, I, I interviewed with a lot of people in DC. And, uh, I knew I kind of wanted to work on the Hill. I, I had some nibbles from boutique PR firms and public affairs firms, but kind of held out. And finally, I was connected with uh, a chief of staff that worked you know for the congressman that I worked for first for three years. Uh, he was also a Penn State grad. So we immediately had that connection, interned for him after my junior year. Uh, and then here's kind of my piece of advice would be, uh, whenever you meet new contacts, stay connected. Uh, especially as a student, I would send them updates, tell them you know, little things that you're working on, whether it's your capstone project, uh, new jobs that you have in state college, uh, other internship opportunities, um, any of these contacts that you make, that you, you, know, you connect with and, and you think, uh, you know, they see potential in you as well, they're going to be interested in, in you as a, a, you know, not only as a professional, but as a person. So send them those updates, keep that line of communication open, and that'll really help you kind of get your foot in the door. So that's kind of how I, I parlayed my internship into a full-time job after college. Uh, and then another thing I would say is don't be afraid to be outgoing. Uh, it sounds really odd to, to reach out to someone that you don't know and say, hey, can I'd love to grab coffee with you. Can I pick your brain about you know, your experiences? Uh, it sounds intimidating. It sounds awkward. But uh, once you get into the professional world, that happens all the time. And people who have been in your shoes will be more than happy to uh, you know, impart their knowledge and their wisdom on you to help you get your foot in the door. Definitely. I think what you said is so important. Um, definitely the coffee thing. I have so many students reach out to me when they're in New York saying, hey, can I pick your brain? And for Penn Staters, I never say no. I always make 15 minutes. So please definitely keep that in mind as you know the COVID restrictions start to lift. And also just staying connected with people, you know, finding something with someone on LinkedIn and asking them, hey, how did you get started? You know, can I pick your brain about this position open at the company? That's just so important. Joe, what would you recommend to today's grads with everything now that's so different than when you maybe started your first job? How would you, you know, say to them to get into the door? Oh, Joe, you're on mute. You know, I, 
I was pushing the space bar, it's supposed to unmute one, but it didn't. Um, I think the first thing I would, I would caution is uh, there's no one silver bullet. It's a, it's a mixture of things. You know, if uh, you were talking about earlier, people from the business school where I think when it comes to finding a job, they're probably a little more black and white than we are in our major. Um, we're, in the, we're in the shades of gray. And, and a lot of different things are important. Um, it's almost hard to prioritize what's, what the more important things are because they all have some level of seriousness to them and can't be ignored. But I, I, um, I was an intern from Penn State uh, when I was a junior at KDKA TV in Pittsburgh. And that turned out to be just absolutely the best, the best thing that could have ever happened to me in terms of eventually getting a job because I made a lot of contacts in that station. And I knew on that list, making contacts and developing relationships in the business and talking to people is very important. So I left the internship, worked over the summer at some local theater in Pittsburgh, the Playhouse, and went back to school in the fall. And when I was graduating, called KDKA and um, tried to track down those people I had met during my internship. They were all gone. They had either moved on to other jobs in other markets, or they'd been fired, or other things had happened in their lives, but they were no longer there. And I thought to myself, all those relationships meant nothing. But even in this case, they did. When I, when I made an interview appointment and I went to see um, the general sales manager of the station, he was brand new at his job. And I told him everybody I had met during my internship and what I had done and things I had worked on. And he was just as impressed to know that I knew other people. And, and that's the kind of business media and I, I dare say all of communications is. Um, it's, it's a relationship business. People want to know who you are and they want to know who you know and they want to have other people. They want to hear other people vouch for you and talk about what a great employee you are. Um, but the two things I would stress, um, everything Scott said, everything everybody has said is, is valid and very important. You need a certain discipline when you first, when you first uh, land on the beach and, and, and you have to have some kind of order to your life. Um, I, I decided I would take a room in my parents' house and I would live in that room. And every afternoon I would make appointments for the next week or two out. And, so important. Yeah, are you uh, rushing me along now? No, not at all. I'm just saying it's it's so important to do that. I had an Excel spreadsheet when I was looking for a job and to just bouncing off of your point, I had every single contact listed in the Excel spreadsheet, their title, what they did, when's the last time I spoke to them. So I just, I think what you're saying is just, <clears throat> I can't stress it enough. And then I was very diligent very disciplined. I had a schedule. I would do all my meetings in the morning because I like early morning meetings and I found that most people do. So I would work the phones in the afternoon and I would go to meetings in the morning. And I did that for a pretty good number of weeks. And, um, and one other aspect of it was I decided I would go to parties. I would go to industry parties. Whenever I heard of one, a cocktail party somewhere, I would go. And at one of those cocktail parties, I started talking to a guy who was a salesperson at KDKA. And he said, um, I want you, after we had talked for a while, I want you to have an appointment and come in and speak to our general sales manager. And that's how I got the meeting with that general sales manager. It wasn't one of the calls I made in an afternoon. 
I couldn't get anybody at KDKA to return a call. Um, it was meeting somebody at a party and establishing that contact and, and getting some benefit from it. So that, that is my core lesson in all of this. Resumes are important. In my day, resumes were a necessary evil, but they were neutral. Today, they can be deadly if not done properly. Um, interviewing techniques, once you have an interview, is, is, uh, is something you need to give a lot of thought to. And with both of those, I would say, get advice. Get a lot of advice about your resume. Get a lot of advice how to write a cover letter. And, and before you leave Penn State, uh, take advantage of some things that you're not going to be able to do outside. Um, really do learn how to write, especially in PR. That's going to be very important. Um, learn how to sell something. Learn how to give a presentation. All of those different things. Learn how companies work. I've been in some of the advertising classes, and they cover this part very well how agencies are set up, how advertising work is conducted, how it all relates to clients, how the business is done. But you need to take it very seriously. And, and when you meet with somebody, be able to wow them with your knowledge about their company, their position, what they do, who their clients are, um, and what the hot buttons are in the industry on that day. Thanks, Joe. That was all great information. I think from that, I'd just re really like to bounce over to Steve. Steve, I know you've held so many different positions uh, across your whole career. And I'm just curious, when you meet with you know young students, people who are graduating, what's kind of the number one attribute that you're looking for in someone that you want to hire? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question, uh, Suzanne. I think um, particularly, in the current environment that we're in, it's obviously extremely challenging. You know, it's interesting listening to uh, Katie and Scott of the younger generation, and then Joe and I, in what uh, Joe, I hopefully can call us the older generation. Uh, but geez, it, it's all about networking and contacts, and, and, and Joe and I used to carry our business cards with us everywhere we went, whether it was to a party or, you know, my, my, just, my quick snippet on how I got into the um, communications is, I actually, and probably a lot of Penn State students can relate to this today, I didn't have a job when I first graduated. And so I took a job as a clothing salesman, believe it or not. And I was selling a suit to a um, county commissioner at a, a new mall, the Granite Run Mall in Media, Pennsylvania, Delaware County. And I um, got to talking to this uh, county commissioner and he asked me about my um, college education and what I was in. And he invited me into uh, the media courthouse to uh, do an interview for an open PR position. And that's how I got into uh, communications about six months after I graduated. So uh, to just kind of reiterate what everybody else has said, that it's so critical just to network. And I think it's a little bit easier these days with the technology that we have that Joe and I didn't have, uh, LinkedIn, obviously. But I think it's also important to still do the kinds of things that Joe and I did. And through that, I would say try to get involved in groups and in associations like PRSA and IABC and join up. And when they have an event, when they have a networking event, uh, go to it. And the other thing I would say is um, uh, go to, uh, stay very involved with the Penn State Alumni Association. Uh, there are a lot of active um, uh, county chapters, particularly in Pennsylvania. I belong, I still belong to the Chester County chapter, the Delaware County chapter. And in um, a normal environment, which we'll go back to shortly, you know, they do events all the time. They do networking events. They do um, sports events, going to uh, Phillies, Flyers, Sixers games. And it's just a great way to, to meet people and network and make contacts. And at the end of the day, that's, that's the name of the game. I would also just add real quickly, Suzanne, that I think it's, and I tell uh, my mentees this at Penn State, I think it's important from a, uh, from a corporate perspective where I worked for 25 years to try to get as much business experience as possible, even at Penn State. So if you can take some business classes, if you can get that SMEAL certificate, I think that's extremely important because I know when I was hiring for many, many years, I was always looking for people with experience, which is 
not hard, not easy to get when you're right out of a, a school, but uh, try to take as many business classes as you can and get to know what a corporation is like, get to know the various functions. And, you know, I think that's, that's important as well. Definitely. I know for me, when I was at Penn State, you know, just being involved in AAF and I know we're on a PR call, the PRSSA competition, those real world experiences, that was what I talked about in interviews. I just really sold all of that as, as hard as I could, because like, you know, everyone has said, you know, 20 years ago today, it's really the same thing. It's about when you go in really being prepared, having a connection, knowing the company, knowing what they're about. Um, you know, I feel like my number one pet peeve is when someone asks me, you know, what is Game Show Network? By the time you're getting to me, you know, especially with the internet, you should be able to know what Game Show Network is. So when you're going into these big agencies, you should know what the agency is, what the huge clients are, and just really go in as prepared as possible. Because to me, that really always makes someone stand out. So Steve, can I, can I, if I could just- Yeah, jump please. So in. Steve's comments about business is, I didn't know what like a PNL was or like quarterly earnings. And I just, if they, I could do one thing differently, I think it would be to do more business stuff because I was like, oh, I know how to do the PR. But like, I think being a really good publicist is knowing how it impacts the business and, you know, how are you going to move the bottom line for these clients? And if you don't really know what moves the needle for them, then like, if you don't understand how their business works, you don't really know what successful PR looks like. So I don't Katie, I think that's such a great point. Scott, if you had to do one thing differently after you graduated, looking for a job, what would you do? Uh, that's a good question. Um, one thing I think I would probably do is kind of look farther ahead. You know, it's great, you know, finding a job, that's the first step, but you always want to kind of be looking two, five, 10 years down the road and trying to, to set yourself up for success. So kind of going off of the whole business, you know, conversation that we've kind of delved into, uh, looking at other opportunities to kind of spread your wings and try something new. So I kind of dove deep into, you know, into policy. Uh, that's what I do. Uh, and it's worked out for me in this world. But say I wanted to, you know, go back into to tradition, traditional PR or comms or something like that. Uh, I would probably be a little bit farther behind than, you know, some of the other panelists on this call because, uh, I don't have that, you know, traditional PR or business experience. So one thing that I would probably do differently is, is really just try something new, look for opportunities to learn. You know, once you graduate Penn State, uh, that's, that's not the end of your educational career. Uh, take some other classes, whether it's a master's degree or even just, you know, random Excel classes or random Tableau classes or random things that, that kind of give you new opportunities to, to learn new skills. Uh, and take advantage of anything that, uh, that's there. One thing that, that's really nice in today's day and age is a lot of companies do offer a lot of that continuing education for free. Uh, and you can kind of take advantage of it during, you know, maybe not during work hours, but, but on the company dime. Uh, and they'll help you, you know, kind of push you in a direction uh, that you may not have seen yourself going right after graduation. Um, but by giving yourself some additional marketable skills uh, you'll set yourself up for the future. It's a great point. As we're kind of talking about real world scenarios and you know what we might have done differently and what we didn't know, Joe, what would you, in your whole career, what would you say one of your most, I guess, toughest tasks or toughest projects was? And how did you, you know, work through it? Well, actually a couple come to mind. Um... Pick business. your favorite. <laughs> well, business-wise, um, I was part of a team that was uh, transferred to New York City by Westinghouse Electric to, um, to buy a network. And there were five of us on this team, and I was representing operations of TV stations, management of TV stations. And... Um, I learned so much over the course of that year that I, I can't even begin, and it changed my life completely, thoroughly. 
the end result changed everything and continues to change it. That experience and what happened from that experience. And while we're on the prior subject too, a lot of that was, you know, you go to have a, a job to do, you're assigned a job, you've uprooted your family <clears throat> and you've moved away and, uh, and you're doing things you don't really know how to do. I didn't know a lot of the financing issues like Steve had, you know, talked about, I wish I had done what he suggested I do. And that's to go to a, a, you know, some business courses and learn something about financing because it would have come in handy. But just a quick side, you know, again, on the theme of you don't really know how things are going to turn out. We targeted NBC and we had developed a very strong relationship with the president of the company and he got us to the board and we were making enormous headway with NBC. And it, it took about two years of work to get to the point where we were able to actually make this happen. Um, and then he died suddenly. And we were obviously in shock because we had now worked very closely with this guy. And he was a young guy. We were really, he had a heart attack or something and he was gone like that. And um, we had a big company meeting we, uh, at Westinghouse in Pittsburgh. And um, we decided everything we've learned in two years, let's not stop. Let's target another network. And we targeted CBS and we walked in the door for the first meeting, literally the day that uh, Lawrence Tisch, who ran the company, decided he would rather sell the company. And after two years of all that work and somebody dying at NBC and thinking all of our hopes are dashed, we closed the CBS deal within 30 days. Amazing. From that point. And I'll never forget it. I mean, I just, it, it's, a, it's a great, to me, it was the, the final example of just about any stupid thing can happen. Yeah. You know, it's Woody Allen, 85% is showing up. If you're there, if you've targeted something and you're working it and you're out there, you will bump into opportunities that you never even consider. I think that's so important. Um, there are so many people, you know, so many students that reach out to me and it really just depends on the day that you reach out. If yeah. one of my buyers reaches out to me and says, Hey, I need a media assistant like immediately. <laughs> and if I've talked to you that day and you've sent me a resume and your resume looks decent and Bob Martin may have recommended that you connect with me, or I've connected with you already on LinkedIn. Great. Like I'm sending your resume over to the company. So it really just goes to show like perseverance and reaching out. It's, it's really all full, full circle for sure. I would, I'd go so far as to say the majority of time. Yes. That is the reason you ended up getting a job. Definitely. It wasn't some particular skill. It was somebody who knew you, knew the way you work, knew your character and said, I want that person working for me. I want that person in my company. I want that person working on this project. I can trust that person. Definitely. Yeah. Steve, you've had such a long career in big pharma. Can you share any insight to everyone on the call? You know, what it's like or, you know, a real life situation that you guys had to tackle within, you know, the company? Sure. Um, well, it's it was a fascinating um, 25 years with a, with a major global pharmaceuticals. It, it was a challenge every day. Um, it, in pharmaceutical PR, there is always a crisis or an issue to be managed. Uh, people are always coming after you about your products, particularly about side effects, or God forbid, if somebody passes away that might be allegedly linked to one of your products. But I really got to enjoy over the years working in crisis communications and issues management. I found it really fascinating 
Um, and I, there's a lot of that in healthcare and particularly in pharmaceuticals. So again, I, my advice would be to think about that and try to take as many issues management or crisis uh, communications uh, opportunities as you can. The other thing that uh, I really enjoyed about uh, my position at AstraZeneca was that it was global and the interactions that I had through the years with um, so many communicators from so many countries was, uh, was fascinating. Uh, the diversity of the cultures and the diversity of the people that I got to know over the years was one of the aspects of my position that I thoroughly enjoyed. Um, it's, it was just amazing to get to know some of these people and to help them kind of, um, the United States was always kind of the leader in terms of communications for the globe, for AstraZeneca, and to kind of help them along in terms of selecting agencies and helping kind of uh, mentor them and educate them and in terms of some of the practices that we had in the U.S., to me was one of the most uh, rewarding aspects of my uh, position, Suzanne. That's amazing. And I think what you mentioned is crisis communication, just for, you know, Scott and Katie, because I know you guys both work in situations where that's so prevalent. Do you guys have a real world example that you could share with the students of, you know, something that needed to be done yesterday that you had to tackle and how you tackled it? I know I have to do this every day, so I'm sure you have so many examples. Yeah, I'll start if you don't mind, Katie. Yeah. Uh, so kind of a, a pretty recent development is, uh, and this is kind of a long story, so bear with me, but, uh, so like I said, I work in, you know, defense policy and, and I work with DOD very, very closely to, to help them tell their story as well. Um, you know, because we have a pretty robust communications arm and, and DOD and, and government agencies in general get very wonky very quickly. They're not, you know, good at connecting with people necessarily. So we kind of help them do that. And we, so, you know, we'll, and then now we'll backtrack about probably 50, 70 years back to the Korean War. Uh, we had a, someone from our state who was a priest, uh, a chaplain uh, who was over in, in Korea, got captured, was a prisoner of war. Uh, and he was still, you know, saying mass and, and catering to, uh, you know, to the soldiers that were in Korea while he was a prisoner of war. Uh, and he unfortunately passed away in the prison camp. Uh, so they buried him with a bunch of other soldiers from the era, and it was lost. Uh, it was an unmarked grave. We didn't really know where you know, what was going on there. About 30 years later, Pope John Paul II uh, knew about this guy and, and named him what's called a servant of God. It's the first step towards sainthood. So it became a pretty big you know, deal, not only within the Catholic community, but within you know, our state and among the Department of Defense as a whole. You know, he, This guy was a shining example of the, the honor and the integrity that, that service members are supposed to uh, exemplify. You know? uh, so that kind of kept things going for us. And we worked with a, a, a specific department within the DOD that uh, all they do is work to identify the remains of, of uh, fallen service members or those who were lost uh, overseas. So we worked really closely with them and with their family to say, we know that this, this chaplain uh, you know, died in this camp uh, around this time, uh, here's his family, here's some artifacts that we can connect you with to identify the body. His, his you know, a bunch of remains from Korea were brought back in the 50s. And just recently we had the technology to really start identifying some of these people through DNA and, and dental and things like that. So we worked closely with them to identify it. And this was, you know, this is going back years. And finally, about three weeks ago, um, we received notification from DOD that this person's remains were identified. So the crisis communication, maybe not crisis, but kind of timely communication piece that we really had to work out with was, you know, with DOD and the family uh, kind of announcing this to make sure that we were the ones controlling the narrative, uh, you know, in, in PR, whether it's, you know, politics or uh, corporate or at a firm, you always want to control the narrative, right? So we, you know, worked with DOD and the family to make sure that our office was the one that was kind of leading this narrative. We were the, you know, the ones that were kind of pushing the story and being, you know, proactive during this entire process. So it's still kind of developing, but uh, we were able to get, uh, you know, specific mentions that we were the ones leading this in the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, Catholic University, um, you know, just national uh, and, and a lot of obviously smaller publications uh, from our state. 
but it was a national story that uh, we were able to kind of lead just because we, we kind of jumped on it a little bit quicker than some other people. And we used a lot of our connections that we had built up, like Joe was saying, over a course of years uh, to be the ones that, that really kind of led that narrative. Amazing. That's so cool. What a great story. Katie, what about you? I don't think I can follow that up. <laughs> <laughs> tough one to follow, tough. <laughs> Sorry, Katie. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, I guess I can just talk about, you know, a recent campaign that we worked on, which was the launch of Indeed's Super Bowl, first ever Super Bowl campaign this year. Um, and just with the, all of the COVID protocols in terms of like creating the advertisement and not being able to activate on site, there were just lots of challenges in terms of, you know, recording the ad. We did not have the final ad until the week of the Super Bowl, which is in um, <laughs> Suzanne, you're like, probably you're like, I could not, I don't know what I would do. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was just really stressful, but you know, as a first time advertiser, there are lots of media opportunities in the advertising trade. So thankfully we were able to, you know, make an impact there, but definitely it was a challenge, um, to, you know, we didn't really get that huge story in the wall street journal or the New York times because they, these publications really want to see, you know, the full assets. And we didn't have that, unfortunately, but lots of lessons learned there. And, you know, the Super Bowl is still a huge event and there were some great storylines. Um, the singer who recorded the song for the ad that we did, I don't know if anyone's seen it and remembers it, but um, it's a cover of the Audra Day song, Rise Up. And it was recorded by the person we got to cover the song was actually a TikTok star who was discovered by Lizzo. Um, so it was like kind of an inspiring story. Um, you know, this young man who didn't have a job, we like gave him a job by hiring him to do this advertisement. The LA Times covered that aspect of the story, which is really cool. Um, but definitely one of those things where we were all ready to go, but sometimes your clients aren't always, you know, ready to meet you where you are. Completely. And I, it must have been so difficult with COVID getting a first time Super Bowl, you know, add in this year. As you mentioned, it was so different. Can you speak to now, you know, in the beginning of COVID to now where your agency is at with hiring and kind of how they're dealing with accounts? Definitely. Um, so when COVID first hit, like I'm sure everyone knows, um, super stressful. I don't think any of us knew really what to expect. Um, one of our biggest clients is Delta. We also work with Airbnb, um, lots of hospitality travel clients. So those are obviously just immediately affected some restaurant groups as well. Um, since I work on, you know, all sporting events canceled, um, thankfully, you know, on the media side of things, I think media is interestingly one of the industries that seemingly did pretty good with the election and COVID people were really, you know, engaged with the media over the past year. So I did have some successes there, but across the agency is definitely really tough. And we really were not hiring at all, um, for most of the spring and, you know, even through most of this past year, but definitely over the spring, we were not doing any hiring. Um, things have thankfully started to pick up both in terms of clients and hiring. So that's been really exciting. In October, I, I brought another Penn Stater over as an account supervisor on my team. So that was really great. And um, yeah, I, I've definitely, we ha um, have been able to refer some Penn Staters for additional openings that we've had. So things are starting to look up. Amazing. I want to end it on that positive note that things are starting to look up. And honestly, we'd love to open this now to questions from the students and how we can kind of best help or guide, you know, anything that we spoke about, anything that you guys might be looking for. To ask a question, if you just go down to the Q&A or chat function and just type it out, you know, we can really see any of those questions. Um, I'll give you guys, you know, a couple minutes to think and just, you know, kind of to summarize what we talked about is really just when you're looking for that job or internship, really being persistent, 
reaching out to your whole network via LinkedIn, like we have now, via the old school ways, like Joe and Steve spoke about. It really doesn't go out of style. It really is who you know. And also, really interestingly enough, to touch on what everyone mentioned, was really know the business and the companies that you're looking for and really try to have real world experience that you gained at Penn State and all of those good things to kind of aid your search. So I see we have one question and I'll just read it out to the panelists. We often hear about things we should do when it comes to applying to internships or jobs, but some of those things could be right place, right time. Is there anything we should avoid doing? Ooh, good one. Any mistakes that any of the panelists personally made? Does anyone want to tackle this? I can tackle at least the, the last part, which is- Go for it. I had a, an assignment for a internship application. Like, you know, I had made it through the first or second interview and then they gave me an assignment they wanted me to work on and send back. I wrote the wrong date down, due date down in my calendar and was like finalizing it until the very last minute, had no idea the deadline had passed, submitted it, like everything was normal, like did not apologize for being late. It was so embarrassing. Um, I was like, I think I did a really good job on this. Like I was so excited. Um, it like a week or two went by, I never heard anything. I was just like, sent a follow-up email. Again, no idea that anything had happened. The woman like called me and she was like, hey, like just so you know, you like completely missed the deadline. I was so embarrassed, but then she offered me the job. Um, so thankfully it all worked out, but <laughs> I was still like, I cannot believe that like, I almost screwed up this huge opportunity. Um, and, you know, thankfully people understand that mistakes happen, but I wish that like, I could have at least owned it. Um, you know, these things happen. And I think hopefully during COVID people are more understanding and empathetic than ever, but, you know, make sure you know your deadlines. So important. We once had someone interview on my team and she wrote us a thank you note, but she wrote my colleague's name wrong in the thank you note. His name is John. And she wrote like, dear, like Joe or just wrong. And he immediately was like, I don't want to hire this person. Like the, this person couldn't even get my name right in the thank you note. Like he was just so not about it. And unfortunately we did not end up hiring. It's not a great ending. We did not hire that person. So I would just say like of two things to avoid, like definitely make sure you know your deadlines. Make sure when you're writing thank you notes, if you emailed with like three people, it's okay to write the same gist of the note, but do make sure, you know, when you go to send and, you're sending the name and the dear name that it all matches up. So I think that's super important. Can I, uh, I would yeah, add something cool. to yeah, all please. that. Um, it's noble to want to try not to make mistakes, but it's also uh, impossible. You're going to make them. You're not infallible. Um, and, and the important thing is recovering from them. Knowing you've made the mistake, knowing how to handle it after the fact, and knowing when you've lost, and this, um, this battle's not yours, and you move on, and you find other opportunities. Because sometimes mistakes are fatal, but you know, just as you may never know why you get a job, you may never ever know why you made a mistake that you made. It just happened and you have to deal with it. Another thing I always tell our entry level students is like, I want you to make mistakes and it's like, you, okay to make mistakes, you should make mistakes, but the important thing is understanding why it was a mistake and you know, making sure that you know what not to do next time. Um, so, um, yeah. And by the way, and, and I never wanna hear, and never make that mistake again. Because I got news for you, I probably will. <laughs> the, um, the other thing I would just add real quick, and then we can move on to see there's another question. And I think it's so important in today's world to keep a clean social media profile. Um, we, as communicators, you would think we would all know better, but we see so many examples these days of poor young people uh, being challenged or even being thrown out because of something they may have written in social media like 10, 15 years ago. So, you know, do your best. Uh, I know everybody's on social media these days, but 
do your best to try to keep it um, keep it clean and not say anything controversial that may come back to bite you because a lot of companies when they are hiring these days are looking at uh, what your social media profile looks like. Yes, that's so important. My mom always tells us that she Googles me and my sisters all the time to see what comes up. And it's really true. You really have to make sure that, you know, you're being careful. And especially when you're applying for jobs, you know, we do it all the time. We get a resume. We'll Google you. We'll check your LinkedIn. And, you know, we want to know who we're hiring. I'm going to move on to the next question. Um, Katie, specifically for you, while working on the Super Bowl project, what was the biggest challenge working with so many different types of people and moving parts leading up to the big game? I will say that is the hardest part about, it was probably the hardest part. Um, you know, we were working with our client Indeed. They also had their own creative agency, 72 and Sunny. And they had our social team, 72 and Sunny social team. To, so we were also doing a social activation in addition to the um, ad itself. And so just trying to like kind of be a project manager, which is not my job, but just trying to keep all of the communications in sync, um, make sure everyone is aligned on all of those things. Um, but yeah, working with so many different people who have their own, you know, 72 and sunny, they have their own interest in what the PR looks like. And um, so does the social team and, you know, everyone has a perspective. So really just making sure that everyone is aligned on the strategy and my client is indeed not, seven, you know, 72 and sunny. So making sure that our goals are being accomplished. Yeah, Katie makes a good point um, that uh, I can relate to in, in my position at AstraZeneca where I was often in the middle of so many different agencies. When we were launching a direct-to-consumer ad campaign, you know, we had the ad agency, we had the digital agency, we had the, my agency, the PR agency, and trying to navigate through that process of getting all these agencies working together for the benefit of us in the company and it can be really, really challenging. And so I think just going back to a question earlier about um, what, are, what are companies looking for? I think if you present yourself as a, number one, as, posit as positive as possible, but number two, as a team player. So, so much work these days is done, whether on the agency side or on the corporate side uh, in teams and, and showing that you're a team player and willing to work in a team environment is absolutely essential these days. I think that's so important and it really leads us into our next question. Um, to any of the panelists, what is the biggest challenge you faced early in your career that taught you lessons that led to successes later? And I'll just say for me that, you know, being part of a team in PR and advertising, it's really important. And when we're looking to hire someone, you know, entry level, we want to know that they're a team player, right? Because when you start off entry level, you know, everyone's been there. The hours in comm can sometimes be long, um, not always the most glamorous, but we want to know that we really hired a hardworking person that's, you know, going to be part of our team. So I think, does anyone want to speak to, you know, challenges early on in their career that kind of taught them lessons, ar lessons around that? Yeah, I can jump in on there. Great. Um, so one thing that I kind of learned was, especially as a recent college grad in an entry level position, you're not going to have all the answers. So do not be afraid to reach out to someone else, you know, whether within your team or someone who uh, has you know, done your job before or maybe, you know, out, outside of your specific team, uh, but may have some experience that might know more about it. You know, you're not going to look, uh, you know, like a bad team player. You're not going to look inexperienced if you ask some of these questions. Because at the end of the day, you know, if you assume that you know what's going on and you try, you know, uh, try to just guess at it, there's a chance, you, you know, you could be wrong and, and you're going to have to go back and do it again anyway. So it's better to, you know, do your due diligence, uh, do some research, reach out to some people and, and ask those questions because, you know, no one's going to look down on you for saying, I'm not sure what's going on right now. Can you help? I totally agree. And I think, um, Another thing is just, you know, I think Scott mentioned, you know, doing your research, like when you come to the table with a question, at least, you know, from my perspective, I love when you say like, Hey, I looked this up and I didn't understand, you know, the specific aspect of it rather than just like, I, you sent me this assignment and like, I didn't really read it. Can we just like, can I ask you a bunch of questions? Cause I want, like, it's, 
I like to see the people I work with kind of do the work first, not like waste anyone's time, but like give it a try and see if you can figure it out. And if you can't come to me or like, you know, really strategic, thoughtful questions. So I know like how you're thinking and um, what you're thinking about. I mean, of course, things are going to come up and you may not have the answer to like small little things. It's just totally fine. But it's so exciting to me when I see people come to me and they're like, Hey, like, can you, can we talk about like this strategy for this client? Cause I don't understand it versus like, I don't know how to do this function in an Excel doc, <laughs> but obviously those things come up too. No, yeah, somebody oh, somebody ahead, once wrote a piece about uh, when you go through a life, you, you end up, you know, doing very well at something and you become kind of an expert. And then through, for one reason or another, you jump to another job where you know nothing and you get to be stupid and awkward again. And, and one, of the, one of the toughest things I found when I was a senior at Penn State is at the senior level, a certain amount of arrogance starts to come into the picture and you begin to begin to feel your oats a bit and, and think you know quite a bit. And then you go off to an internship or your first job, first real job. And there is nothing more awkward and nothing that makes you feel more stupid than that. You get to be dumb again. Like being a freshman at Penn State, you get to be stupid again. And it's a life lesson that will repeat every time you change to another job, it will repeat. And it was Scott's comment that kind of got me remembering that because, you know, you don't want to give in, you don't want to be the shy person, you don't want to, you don't want to suffer from, from uh, awkwardness, you want to transcend it somehow. And one of the best ways to do that is to ask people questions, get to know them wherever you are at an internship or a new job or whatever, get to know the people, ask them questions. You're not alone. You're not expected to act alone. You're expected, as Steve said, to work as part of a team. And that will get rid of a lot of the awkwardness. Definitely. Um, oh yeah, please. If I could just add real quick, the thing that always um, worked for me um, when I went into a new position, just like Joe was saying, is to try to find a mentor within the company or the agency, mm -hmm. typically outside of your own scope, outside of, outside of communications, not, not your own uh, immediate supervisor, but somebody else in the corporation or the agency that can kind of you know, show you the ropes and help you avoid the uh, landmines of internal politics. Mm -hmm. Because internal politics is what sometimes can torpedo a career and having somebody with more experience that can kind of help you navigate the internal politics of a, of a corporation or agency can be very, very beneficial. I found it very beneficial in my career. I think that's so important. And I think that's something that as a senior or a new grad, you really don't know about the real world is that there's so much polit like there's so much politics within companies and you just don't really understand it until you're in it and that's just such a good point and I just want to emphasize it and I also want to emphasize that literally at my first job it took me I was the person that asked so many questions it took me so long to learn the booking system my boss later told me they were like we were worried that you weren't going to get it and then all of a sudden, like three months in, I got it and I was fast and they were like, okay, all right. So don't be that person that's afraid to ask questions, especially when it comes to like money and communications. We'd rather you come to us and ask questions and get it wrong. And I just, that's an important point to emphasize. So the next question is a great one. Um, thank you panelists for an informative and interesting presentation. This was great. What is your advice for students who are trying to figure out if they want to work in-house for a large company or for an agency? Also, what is your advice for students who are trying to figure out if advertising or PR is the right track for them? Thank you so much. 
Joe, you wanna you wanna answer that because you are on the ad track, really. And I asked you to do PR tonight. <laughs> yeah, but I've I've never really worked for a PR or an ad agency, although I think they're becoming one and the same. Um, they're kind of melding. Um, and but I've I uh, I think it's a very personal choice whether you want to work in house or for a specific agency. I think that's a very, that's something you have to kind of wrestle with and get some experience, hopefully both ways. And then you can make a decision for the longer term. Not everything you do when you graduate is set in stone, set in concrete for the rest of your life. There'll be many, many changes, more than you can possibly imagine. And you'll have chances to correct, to repeat, to leap ahead, to do all kinds of different things. Um, but I can't tell you which one is better. I can tell you that if I were making a choice, I'd rather be in-house at some other company than work for a PR firm or an ad, a, 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 ad agency. But that's my personal, that's the way I've grown up. I think it's so important what you just said, and I want to highlight it. And then maybe the other panelists can touch on it. Your first job is not what you have to do for the, your whole career, right? You know, right. you are in college, you think you're going to graduate and you think you're going to do one thing. And then you, if you get out into the real world and you hate it, you know, you're not stuck there, right? This is why you have so many different connections. This is why you have your little Excel spreadsheet with all of your contacts and where they work and your LinkedIn page and Penn State. And it's so important, Penn State, it's just such a great, network and really you know scott's in dc katie and i are in new york you know steve worked in pennsylvania joe really worked everywhere you know there's always someone from penn state no matter where you are and everyone should take comfort in that <clears throat> so for sure um does anyone else want to touch on you know trying to figure out large company or agency or just trying to figure out the advertising or pr track yeah um, i'm sorry okay. Okay. Uh, you go Okay, I'm just going to give a quick anecdote. I think in a in a big multi-billion dollar corporation like I was fortunate enough to be in for 25 years, it was not common to hire uh, young people right out of university. It was, and I've said this to a lot of my mentees at Penn State, it, if you're going into the world of PR, it might be good to start uh, and get your feet wet in a big PR agency if you can get into it, like a like a Fleischman or an Edelman or a Burson or, a, uh, or an Ogilvy. And we were more typically hiring people that had had two to three to maybe five years experience from an agency like that into the corporate world. It was, it was not easy to go right into a big global corporation right out, out, out of the bat. So um, if you have the opportunity and you're looking into PR and it may be the same thing in advertising, Katie can, uh, maybe some of the other guys can speak to this, but I, I think in our in our situation, we were typically, and when I hired several people in my career that had come directly from PR agencies, but they had started out as junior account executives that kind of worked their way up at the Edelman's and the Bursons and ultimately landed with us at uh, AstraZeneca. I think Steve is exactly on point. Um, I, I completely agree is, um, I don't know if anyone on the call has like taken classes at Tara Wyckoff, but all throughout college, or I guess my whole senior year, she was like, you know, Katie, I really think that you should apply for jobs after graduation at agencies. And I was like, I don't really think I would like an agency. I'm not going to apply. And, or like I would apply for them, but I like wasn't excited and like probably didn't, wasn't passionate in the interviews and stuff. Um, and I had always applied for agency internships and like never really gotten any. So I was very anti-agency. And I think I thought that, that you know, I don't know. It just didn't seem like it was going to be a good fit for me. And then I worked at a corporation and they weren't doing so well. And there wasn't a ton of opportunities for me to advance, especially at that junior level, like Steve was talking about. It was very admin heavy and there wasn't a lot of opportunities for growth. And so it's like, you know, I was applying for hundreds of jobs. And finally I got an offer from DKC and I was like, I really don't want to work at an agency and I love it. And I think Tara always says it's like getting, you know, a master's degree. You just go in and like I was talking about before, like learning so much about the business world 
Um, I work with so many different clients. I feel like you just learn so much so fast. And I definitely agree with Steve that you know, when people, you know, three, five years into their time at an agency often end up going in house, but I think you really get to, you know, cut your chops. Um, so I would also a, uh, there's also a practical aspect here too. You're looking for a job. You're out finding leads. You're out making contacts, trying to get a job. And the question coming up sort of touches on this, you know, when the COVID time, the time of COVID, Um, are you really going to take whatever comes along first? Probably. I don't think it has anything to do with COVID or the time we're in. I mean, I can't remember. If anybody can remember, tell me the last time you ever heard anybody say, thank God I'm graduating this year because there are so many friggin' jobs out there. I can take my pick. Well, the answer, by the way, is 1996. So it was a long time ago. It's probably not going to be there again for a while. So you are going to end up making a lot of decisions, even in the interviewing process about different jobs that you might be offered. But in the end, there is that practicality. You, you're going to take one of the jobs. You're going to do something. And once you're in somewhere, you're going to make other decisions. Yeah. And, you know, while we just jumped over to the COVID uh, uh, question real quick, um, I do I do think it's it's short term. I think we're seeing a light at the end of the tunnel. We're seeing things start to come back. And I know just from my own experience, um, people that still work in in um, companies or agencies, they they feel a real need to get back to in-person client engagement, in-person meetings. Uh, We are living in an environment, obviously, for the past year where virtual and Zoom have exploded. But I I do believe over the next uh, year, things are going to improve. I think a lot of companies and agencies are going to move at least to a hybrid model again and get uh, get away from five days a week working from home. And I just hear from so many of my colleagues that, uh, particularly in healthcare, feel they need to get back to personal engagement. And it's probably not going to happen, you know, before uh, a lot of seniors graduate, but it is going to happen at some point in 2021. I agree with that. Um, I think that people are definitely wanting to get back to the office and get back to a sense of normalcy. But I also wanna just touch on that question about COVID and maybe taking a job that you're not 100% sure of. And I think, you know, and panelists, please interrupt me. I think it's always better in communication to be working. I think you're always more marketable when you're working. I think the best thing that you can say is, you know, for example, if you take a job and you stay for a year and it really wasn't what you wanted, when you go into the next job and they're asking you, you know, why are you interested in this field or you don't necessarily have the exact experience, you can always spin it and you can always say, listen, you know, I started out X, Y, and Z and, you know, let's say research. I discovered Excel tables weren't for me (laughs) and I realized that I really do want to write and here's what I, you know, written while I was at Penn State, here's the experience that I have and here's what I know I could do for you and make that lateral move. So I don't really think it's ever a mistake taking a job. If, you know, you have some interest there, I think that work, it's always better to be working. So I would recommend that. Scott, do you have anything you want to add to that? Yeah, I would definitely agree with that, Suzanne. Um, Definitely better to be working. I mean, when you go into interviews, uh, people may look at your resume and say, you have a a blank spot here for about six months, what was going on? So it's, you know, obviously good to fill that with some meaningful work experience. And another thing I would add too is, even if you, you know, at a first glance, while you're interviewing, getting familiar with the company, it may not seem like the best fit. My big thing is never, never turn down an opportunity. You know, you could always go into, you know, this job that you may not think uh, it really fits you or your personality or your interests, and you could end up loving it. Uh, if you don't, so be it. You move on and, and it was a learning experience and, and you're better for it. But, uh, you know, just turning down an opportunity because it doesn't look right from the outside. Um, you know, you could be selling yourself short and you could be, you know, closing the door that, that you'll regret later in life. So, uh yeah, I would, I would echo Suzanne's comments with, with that, you know, just keep an open mind. Um, 
and things will work out for the best. And I think this is going to be the last question of the night because we've kept everyone on. Thanks so much for your attention, for your patience. Um, the last question is, what resources, books, professionals to follow, et cetera, do you recommend for gaining a better understanding of the different facets of the media industry and ad PR? What is the best industry-related book you have read or a professional organization that you follow? I think I'll give everyone just a couple minutes just to think about their answer. Since I'm more on the outside of PR, I can just say, I feel like just following people on Twitter and all of the public relations agencies, I would just follow them. You know, I work more in the advertising field, but I make sure on Twitter that I'm following all my big clients to see, you know, what their next move is and what they're focusing on. And if they're, you know, coming out with a new campaign, just so I stay in the know. And it's a really great place to really have everyone in, you know, one fell swoop. Um, LinkedIn too, if you follow the companies, they're often sharing, you know, who their big hires are, what they're focusing on for the rest of the year. So I would definitely recommend, you know, those two websites to start. Does anyone else want to jump in? I think the trade publications are still, and so many of them are obviously online these days, but, uh, you know, the O'Dwyers and the um, PR Week and Ad Week, I mean, they're still critical uh, publications to track. And, like you were saying, Suzanne, you can you can track them through through Twitter, through online, um, but uh, and also as I said earlier, I think it's important to stay engaged and stay involved in some of these uh, organizations like PRSA and IABC, and try to attend as many um, uh, events when they come back as uh, as possible. And even in the meantime, you know they're doing virtual events. Anyone else have any recommendations? I'll jump in with a quick one. Yeah. Uh, so obviously as a guy who kind of works in DC, uh, I like to think of myself as someone who, you know, might be in the West Wing. Not a book, but, you know, something, something positive like that. Uh, in reality, it's probably a lot more like Veep. But uh, it's, uh, you know, finding some of those TV shows, too, that, that you can watch and, and may portray, you know, not entirely accurately uh, what an industry is, but at least give you some insight. Uh, but to bring it back to, you know, more of a serious answer, uh, I would really start reading memoirs. Um, you know, I personally, I don't really like reading nonfiction. I like reading fiction more, you know, where I'm sitting in front of a computer all day doing a lot of heavy reading, and I don't feel like coming home and and reading a memoir, but I've kind of forced myself to do, you know, one serious book and then one fun book and one serious book and one fun book. And for the serious books, I've try been trying to read a lot more memoirs, autobiographies, things like that. You know, if you can find some people in the ad and PR world that, uh, that interest you, you, you know, you think their company is pretty cool. You think they have a good backstory, hearing directly from them, how they got their start and some of the struggles and the journeys they went through to get there uh, in their own words is really interesting. And then um, I'm sure everyone's probably heard of Malcolm Gladwell, but I find his books really interesting if we're going to talk about, you know, human psychology and, and talking really about communication and, and human interaction, how, you know, there's a lot of science that goes in between, you know, how people interact with each other. And you can definitely use that as a PR or ad professional, uh, you know, some of those social sciences. So um, he's one of the guys that I, I also like to read, but I am a huge book nerd, so totally echo everything Scott's saying. Um, and I'm also a huge fan. I think some Jess wrote in the comments, Mad Men, amazing show, especially if you want to work in communications marketing. Um, but I also, my other favorite show is Succession, and I'm a huge media nerd. And it's a um, great look at the media industry. But again, <laughs> on a more serious note, I'm a big fan of newsletters. Um, I know I'm sure Scott wakes up every day and reads Politico Playbook. And my goal every day is to get all my clients in Politico Playbook. So just getting a sense of, you know, your the industry newsletters, you know, if it's the skim or if it's, um, you know, even other like more industry focused ones based on like the categories that you're, you might be interested in working in. Um, I do a lot of political ones, a lot of marketing ones, um, and just really understand, like, it just gives you, you know, often like the five, 10 things you need to know that day. And like, what's really driving the news cycle, which is so important in PR. It's like, 
you know, you wouldn't want to be pitching something that might be insensitive based on the news cycle or just like Mm -hmm. attentions are totally somewhere else. You know, when it's the, during the 2020 election, you wouldn't want to be pitching some like really fun, exciting lifestyle um, thing to like a reporter who's really focused on the election. So um, just knowing your audiences and the reporters that you want to work with. So newsletters, I think are a great, easy, fun way to do it. And the added, the added benefit, the added benefit of that is you often get names, real names of people that you should call or contact somehow. So Politico Playbook wished me happy birthday a few months ago. <laughs> and that's there's, also some, um, there's also some great history books out there if you're interested in the history of PR and how it's evolved over the last 50 to 70 years, written by people that were the original founders of public relations, Harold Burson, uh, Edelman, uh, David Finn from Reuter Finn. Uh, fascinating books, particularly Harold Burson, who has uh, passed away over the last couple of years. But, uh, you know, he's kind of like the father of PR. And reading his uh, um, his books and his publications of how he started Burson Marsteller and how it evolved over the years is, um, is fascinating and good history if you're seriously interested in having a career in PR. Well, this has all been really informative. I want to take a minute just to thank each of our panelists, Steve, Joe, Katie, Scott. Thank you so much for your time. Um, To all the students still on the call with us an hour and 19 minutes in, we really appreciate you. We hope that you got something out of this. Um, All of our names are here on the Zoom. So like we said, look us up on LinkedIn, connect with us if you have any other questions, and hopefully we will see you soon. But thanks so much, everyone. Have a great night. Thank you too, Suzanne. Thank you.